Uh, but today, uh, we're going to be talking about battle-tested application security, uh, the why you should listen to me. Uh, you probably should. You should probably go to a different session. Uh, but I, I, I've done this for a little bit of time, uh, a good portion of my career, and uh, a lot of it has been in financial services where you're dealing with regulators. You're dealing with a lot of people that are trying to make sure you do all the things to make sure you're protecting not only your customers, but critical infrastructure. And that's, that's a big challenge within itself. Um, a little bit about my background, it's already been read, so we can skip this and kind of jump right in, uh, which is cool. Uh, but the motivation behind this talk, uh, I just want to take the moment to say, you know, as I've shifted in the past six months to a startup for the first time of a non-publicly traded company, I'm jumping out of purely application security. It's a little bit of a, a journey for me, but at the same time, I know the law of recency is going to take effect and I'm going to forget a bunch of stuff. Um, as part of that forgetting process, I want to make sure I share as much as I can because this has been my personal intellectual property as far as how I go into programs, how I build out security teams, what I do differently within an organization. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of rinse and repeat. Um, and if you sat down with me, I could show you the exact blueprint with a lot more detail and like actual spreadsheets to get this done, but a lot of it is just thought process now in having the discussion, how do you interview? Uh, but as we go through, this is just all my stuff. Uh, this is not reflective of any of these companies in the past, but I've taken the same thoughts to every place. Here's the, the, the format that we're gonna be going through. Feel free to interrupt, raise a hand. Uh, I will say at the end of this talk, I'm gonna be running out of the room and jumping into a car and flying out to Vegas, so I'm not gonna have the moments to hang out, and I would love to chat with folks, but my contact information is gonna be at the end. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you're an SF. I would love to have coffee, lunch, whatever. I'm semi-social. So let's get in. How do you build an application security program? You've been called up either internally to your org or you've looked at this new job that says application security manager and you're like, shit, that sounds awesome. I want to do that. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, I don't know where to start and there's engineers doing stuff. Uh, maybe I'll just get some scanners and then call it a day. I got an AppSec program. Well, I, I don't fully recommend that. Uh, what I do recommend is learn your tech culture. And what I mean by that is during the interview process, you start to get a clear understanding of how code is delivered, what tech stacks are being used, what languages, what IDEs. IDEs back in the day for FinTech, um, it was very much Eclipse and Visual Studio. Now you're seeing more thin client, Atom. Uh, you're seeing sublime text being used by engineers. Sometimes you're just seeing Vim and Nano. It's getting smaller and smaller. So your visibility into that tool set and some of those solutions you could have kind of built in are disappearing. So I think the, the, the real element here for step one is know what the hell and why you're going to do it and understand the motivation behind it. And we'll get into more detail of the why there. Second thing, ignore all of those vendors out there when you're first starting. Um, if you're a vendor, I apologize, and I've worked with some of you, I love you. Um, <laughs> if you want to fight about it later, that's fine. But what I mean by this is in that first 30 days, or even that interview process, don't listen to your friends. Don't listen to the people outside. Listen to the folks working. Listen to the teams that are engineering. What are their pain points? What doesn't make sense? Did a compliance person show up and say, PCI 6.5 says you must do X, Y, and Z. PCI says you must harden this server. And the team's like, well, we told them we hardened it, but they won't look at any of the configs. So what do we do now? And I'm like, that's a really good question. Like, how are we hardening? Well, I'm just hardening it based on what I know from the internet because no one's giving me guidance. And I'm like, where are you getting that? CIS benchmarks. I'm like, that's perfect. Have they looked at that? They're like, I don't think they know what CIS benchmarks are. And then you go through that dialogue and you're like, Hey, so compliance people, how does this work? They're like, well, they got to harden the server. And you're like, what the hell does that mean? Well, according to Pete, I know, skip that part. How do they do that? And if you take the time to dismantle some of your own peers and comrades, you'll have more insight into what is that experience and the why. Now, from a vendor standpoint, coming back to this second point, if there have been assessments before you got there, if there have been some technologies already deployed, absolutely listen to those folks. If they did a pen test, they have a shit ton of results, nothing's been resolved, listen. Uh, but don't take the upsell. Never take the upsell, right? Never listen and say, oh great, this, this solution is gonna solve it. And uh, we'll get more into that uh, animosity that I have into certain things that are silver bullets. Third, I mean, you literally have to be willing to put in the work. If your engineers are putting in 100 hour weeks and you're showing up from, I don't know, 10, to 3.30, no one's gonna take you seriously. If there is a significant issue and that's when you're grinding, they'll get it. But at the same time, you have to be there for the release cycle. You have to understand how code is getting moved out the door. And if a build breaks and production's going down, I had an example where 
one of our sites was just not responsive. Guys like, hey Ty, if the TNCs aren't available on our site, um, can we just default to some other legal language? I represent legal too right now. That's a whole other bag of shit that we'll talk about that I love to do. But I'm like, that's interesting. Why are T's and C's down? Go to the website. I'm like, you know, the, the whole site is down now. And then I look over to my peer that leads all of our stability. And I'm like, the website is currently down. Even though it's loading, there is no content. He's like, it's this one vendor. And I'm like, okay, let's go figure it out. But if you're not part of that dialogue to know what stability looks like, what uptime looks like, no one's gonna take you seriously when it comes to fix my input validation flaw, right? So let's shift. Um, let's get into the general approach. You're not gonna hear me talk about specific practices or touch points in this. What you're gonna talk about is more narratives around these relationships. So development, we kind of covered that. Um, operations is an interesting one. The reason I mention operations is obviously there's a DevOps movement. It's happened. If you haven't heard of this, uh, go do some reading and then come back into the talk because I think we're gonna not spend a lot of time there. I think that's something you should just know if you wanna get into AppSec. If you want to work at a company that releases software once a year, I don't know, you, you, you probably have three other jobs because that's gonna be boring as shit. Um, I think from an operation standpoint, understand that deployment process. If they're using Hudson Jenkins, if they have Concourse, which is the new hotness, and I'm a big fan because it's all YAML files, just config based, very magical. Controls aren't there, identity's getting better, but it, it, it's an element where if you don't understand how that code goes out the door, you're gonna miss, well, how do I get RuboCop? How do I get, uh, you know, Breakman? Um, congratulations to Justin Collins, you know? Like, how do I get Breakman hooked up to look at these gems because no one's cared about static analysis before this. Everything was peer review. Um, how many folks have done a due diligence assessment and everyone's like, we do code review. You're like, that's cool. What tools do you use? Oh, we do, uh, you know, we do a peer review. Um, and then we have a couple linters. And then you're like, that's great, but where's your security assessment and your static analysis? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, we use a linter. That linter doesn't have any security capabilities, so where do you get any of this sort of aspect when it comes to building security in? They're like, that's a good question. And then you break down that vendor and you say, you must do X and Y to make sure this partnership is healthy. Security, we talked about it. If your compliance folks are just ruining the lives of those engineers and those ops folks, you can be the hero that brings sanity to the world that is insane when it comes to folks that don't know what the hell they're doing in security because maybe they stumbled into it, maybe they read some regs, maybe they just got lucky. Um, you gotta help the organization and if you're in an org where you truly believe the mission, you're all there to win together. And if you're at a company where you don't believe the mission, leave that job, go find something else that makes you passionate because if you're doing software security to protect your customer or your peers and you don't believe it because there's poor ethical practices because there's breaches left and right and you're exhausted because maybe the product is just terrible and it's violating privacy left and right. If all of those things are happening, there's no way you're ever gonna get an AppSec program off the ground if you're dealing with legal all the time because data is just bleeding out from your mobile app and you're reselling it and you're not telling your customer. Architecture, these folks can be um, great peers, uh, at least getting the blueprint on where is your domain target architecture going. Maybe it's not all there, you have a bunch of tech debt, but you have to understand where you're going and how you're gonna build. This gives you insight into the forecasting, the ability to actually invest time and energy, your research time, you know, when the new hotness was Docker, now it's more containerization. You have to know where to put that time and effort as opposed to I'm buying every solution out there to be covered. Here's the reality, a lot of these solutions already have built-in security capabilities that all you have to learn is how does Kubernetes work, what is AppArmor, and you get to move forward. Look at Java. If you look at Java and understand how the Java security module or some of the frameworks are built now, you don't have to go by some of these tools that used to say RASP or say another term now. It, it will give you ability to actually have that fundamental protection built in. Next, criteria for success. Uh, goals and measurements, I'm the last person that will tell you you need metrics. I but um, I love metrics. Uh, I don't like metrics all that much from the standpoint of you can measure anything, but you can measure yourself to death. Uh, I've been on a team where it was me, another guy doing some work, and then we had two guys doing metrics. The problem with that picture is we had two guys measuring two guys doing work. The frustration inside of me and the animosity that kept rising every day, and I'm pretty animated, but uh, we had a lot of vocal discussions of why using cosine and sine in some of our measurements to get to that place of how we measure like risk is stupid. Um, 
And then they would tell me, it's really simple. And I'm like, I'm a dummy, but here's the problem. No one else is gonna ever care about how any of this is measured. What we need to look at is impact, likelihood. What is our defect density? But what I really care about is how much coverage do we have? What is our portfolio? Those are things that actually matter. The amount of findings that you unravel from an application, look, that's great if you have one app. If you have 5,000 or 9,000 applications, those 100 findings on that one app doesn't mean shit because you probably have that one application that everyone forgot about that serves JavaScript on your front end and it's still secured only username and password and it's sitting in that data center and you luckily stumble onto it because you got an awesome person on your team looking at the perimeter and they're like, yeah, what the hell is this thing? And I'm like, let's go find out. You go to your configuration management database or your asset inventory, it's not listed and you shit yourself and you say, hey, I need to go talk to incident response and figure out what the hell this is and if it's been exploited. And that is definitely part of application security. So be prepared. AppSec is not a nine to five job. I mentioned that before. You have to be prepared for those crap moments where you're going to be involved with forensics. You're going to be involved with incident response. Maybe you might reverse some malware if it gets dropped on a box because struts two hits and no one knows how to read code as part of it, but someone's doing network analysis. Your other team's stressed out because they've been working 48 hours straight, and you're like, I mean, I'll take a look. It's just some file. Do some reverse engineering, and this looks bad, and that's your response, and then you go further, right? But be prepared in those moments to respond and be part of the team. Next, educate for scale. Uh, what I mean by this is really live coaching. Uh, CBTs, computer-based trainings, instructor-led trainings, uh, some of the gamified training, like, those are great. They're wonderful, um, but at the same time, think about your end user. If you all get the same CBT, that sucks because you're not hitting the right tone. Your salesperson operates much differently than your engineer. Your engineer operates much differently than your executive, and your executive overrid everything that's in that policy and said, I'm getting this device and I don't care what our MDM solution says. That's the reality that we have to deal with, but at the same time, you have to take the time to step back, understand what they need to be successful. And if you try to boil the ocean by saying, well, I told him to read the information security policy, and there's that compliance guy sitting over there that was reading PCI and telling everyone this, and you're like, the reality is no one's fucking reading this. So how do we move it forward? Take the time, understand what the end users look like. What does their day look like? Your developers and engineers, what do they need for success? It's not prescriptive guidance. It's not secure coding standards. It's guidelines. It's more intent. It's learning in real time. It's you being present for these discussions and coaching and like actually knowing the topic and the subject matter. And if you don't, not a big deal. Say, I don't know it. Don't lie to them. Don't act like you know some shit because engineers and a lot of other folks are really smart. I'm just a dumb person and I want them to understand that I know some things, but I don't know everything. Uh, but I will respect everyone in what they're doing. One example here is audit and regulators. Any auditors in the room? Cool, any regulators in the room? Great, okay, so. Um, when I look back at my career, especially in FinTech, early on uh, launching static analysis, I came back to this fundamental challenge of why aren't we tracking every static analysis vulnerability? I'm like, holy shit, that's, that's 50,000 flaws. And in my head, I'm like 26, the first time I had this conversation. I'm like, why don't we track it? I'm like, oh yeah, because logically I can't track 50,000 issues in any defect management system, so where do I start? They're like, you must track all of these vulnerabilities. I'm like, so let me pull that back. These aren't vulnerabilities. These are coding flaws. So th these, these aren't really defects or bugs yet. These are flaws. And, and taking the time to unpack and really learn that lesson there paid dividends for every other place that I've worked because that concept is lost on a lot of those two categories. Why? Because all they see is ran a tool, had output. Did you action output? It's a process mentality, right? And you have to be able to educate them on the aspect that you know, while it matters, at the same time, can I look at all 50,000 issues and ask an engineer to triage 50,000 issues? No, but can I take the time and look at the top end of that or a key category and validate through additional manual testing to say this is a vulnerability because it scares me when I look at the output? Yes, that is a vulnerability, it should be tracked, and you get that relationship going much more effectively because your auditor or your regulator is that much more educated and hopefully they don't ask your peers the same damn question of why aren't you tracking 50,000 flaws? Next, Kaizen to enhance, uh, you know, read the Toyota way, uh, more modern language here is retrospective. So, you know, within security, we always have to be transforming. We always have to be learning. And if you want to just know one thing and you can just do AppSec, 
good luck. Um, this is an exhausting career path. If you're not up reading almost every night or every week, this is gonna be a struggle. Um, new vulnerability, new exploit, uh, new language, new JavaScript framework that may last for three weeks because it's cool. And while you may hate that thing, you have to be on board with the idea of learning it because your engineers are doing it and they're stoked about Rust. Rust is great, let's go, let's learn Rust. Um, but what can Rust do for you? You have to learn that angle because they're focused on what it's doing for them. How can you get that intelligence for security? The postmortems are important from the standpoint of gaining feedback, being humble. And when you ask an engineer what went well and what didn't go well, and you change because of that, or you enhance a process because of that, as opposed to this is what the regulator told me I must do. I love the regulator, I love the auditor, but you're there to defend your peers. You're there to help, you're there to win. And as a part of that, you wanna make sure that you're providing the support and the feedback on why you're changing a process. And if one engineer stands up for the rest of the organization and you have this realization that, oh crap, maybe we are tracking metrics a really bad way because we're using cosine and tangent in our measurements. You adjust and you make it simple and it will add a ton of value. Last thing, I always do this. I, I try to create a mission statement, but uh, I haven't read it. Like my mission statement's pretty much been the same thing as far as what I do when it comes to application security. It's you want to be in alignment with the business and how it moves. You don't want to be the laggard. You don't want to create gates that don't allow deploys to go. You want to make sure it is fast. How that happens, a lot of work, a lot of people, a lot of action. Um, so the SDLC and the PDLC, so this is, I'm, I'm gonna touch this really lightly, I'm just gonna open this one up. Um, Waterfall Agile, I hope I don't have to explain this one too much. The areas that I'm gonna focus in on intent are really, we mentioned gates, um, gates are dead. Uh, you know, if you wanna believe that you have a security gate because everyone comes to you and you digitally sign something or click a thumbs up in Slack and there's a control for it, great. But the reality of most code going out the door is you're not in the GitHub cycle. Uh, you're not part of that change management process, but can you watch it? Can you respond? And I think when it comes to agility and fast code deployment, that is an opportunity for you to be part of that discussion like we mentioned before. You're just present and you're seeing the code move. You're seeing the alerts, you're seeing the failures, you're seeing DDoS attacks happen, you're seeing botnets slam against the site and you're communicating. The other thing I'll mention, uh, this is, uh, I wouldn't say the bane of my existence, but I really dislike information security policies that say you must remediate within you know, 30, 60, 90 days based on the risk of this issue. Um, how many times has a release aligned to that date? Never, ever. And did you help that team be successful or did you just give them a black eye because you showed some metrics, they're out of compliance because it's past 30 days, um, and the executive says, well, Ty, they only release code once a year and it's through a third party, so how would they ever remediate in 30 days? And you're like, well, shit, out of 5,000 applications, I got that one wrong. Learn the lesson, right? And I think that's where you have to realize if your code releases every four hours, your risk tolerance becomes much more important. So maybe it is every other release, maybe it's two releases, but this is per product team and per engineering team and you have to get down that flavor and that path of how each team works. This takes relations, this takes intelligence, this can come with automation and visibility, but I think it's really important to understand that that 30, 60, 90 day path is only gonna get you in hot water when you're trying to explain why your metrics are so far behind on remediation. Next, um, engineering team composition. I think this is absolutely important. Uh, if you're interviewing for this job, ask this question up front. Make sure you get full clarity on how code is delivered and the why. Um, if it's insourced as an AppSec person, this is the most fun. You're all there winning together. You're all building together. And I think this is where you know the theme across these is be present, realize how it works, trust people, empower them to move fast. Um, don't be a blocker, you know, just that, that will always come up in the Agile world. If you're being a blocker to the release because you can't coordinate a pen test, your tool's not working because you can't hook into the QA environment, the QA environment's not stable because it's on one developer's laptop. Look, these things are the reality of how we have to operate sometimes, it sucks. But it's on that dude's laptop or that lady's laptop, I'm going to the room, I'm sitting down, I'm like, how can we get this done because it is not great. When is it gonna get better? Or how do we plan for this to get done right now? And those are things that I think are absolutely important. And again, that relational DNA is always gonna take you further. When it's outsourced, uh, it's not as fun. 
It's really not, uh, but I think this is worth something that is amazing in the OWASP community, and I've used it, and it doesn't get updated a lot. It's the Software Security Annex. So if you have third parties that you're outsourcing a lot of this effort to, there is contractual obligations and language that you would expect as an internal program that you're expecting on that outside. So just build it into the contract, validate against it, work with your third party due diligence or vendor management team, and I think you're gonna get a lot better sort of visibility into how that can work. But the, the fun aspect isn't as fun. You're speaking with lawyers more often, you're speaking with security folks, you're not speaking with engineers, you're not building, you're looking at software that's just delivered. Not as fun. Um, you know, the standards, the expectations, the attestation, there are solutions and vendors that are out there that if you have a big enough budget and you're in these large scale organizations, you can ask a company to vet against your service provider as opposed to, you know, the SMB style that they're using to get their stuff done and you just don't trust it because you've not heard that company's name before because it's one guy in a van. That's the reality of it. Now, the last one's COTS. Um, this is the worst. Uh, you know, you're buying solutions and software and they just basically get white labeled and they slap a logo on it and they move forward and they call it a day. Again, comes back to contract language. The key point I'll make here is customer advisory board. How do you influence the backlog? This is always important even dealing with vendors. If your company and your authentication breaks because you've introduced a new way that you're authenticating and the engine just doesn't work, how and when is that bug gonna get fixed? And if you cannot influence that backlog, that should not be a partner. The same goes for any COD solution provider. I have 10 minutes, so we're gonna cruise. Um, you know, the silver bullet solution, uh, you know, I, I think it'd be great to look at one of these and say, yeah, we did it, y'all. We paid this company money, they came in, they did it, and we have an AppSec program. That's terrible, that's the worst idea, don't do it. Um, and again, the why. You're, you're not gaining the intelligence, you're outsourcing everything, you have to be very careful. Um, there are amazing partners here, there are tried and tested partners here. There are solutions that work really well here, but if you come to this and you say, I'm choosing, point to whichever one you want, and you say, I saw it in the magic quadrant. A lot of research went into this, but what if they don't have the language that you need covered? Then you just chose wrong because you just saw it on board. And that can happen sometimes with executive leadership because they saw this report and they're like, how come we're not using, name a name, and we're like, well, they, they just don't work for us. Well, why not? It's something that just doesn't give us coverage. Well, I'd like to do business with them. It's like, well, there's no reason to do business with them. Uh, next, so I'm gonna kick through this real quick, open it up. Um, you know, I think when you look at staffing a team, uh, this may be straightforward to some folks. Um, I, I, I think sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. It depends on your regionality. It depends on your location. It depends on your dev shop. If you're all US and national and you have one footprint like I do now, we're all in San Francisco. It's fantastic. But if you have a footprint here, you have a footprint on the East Coast, you have a footprint in the UK, India, China, you have to look at different cyber laws, you have to understand how things actually work, you have to look at HR practices, there's a lot more to understand on how you build out that team and get that connectivity. Um, insourcing, so much more rewarding, but how many people really like managing people? I go like this some days. Some days I do, some days I don't. Um, you know, when they're doing great, I absolutely love it. When something goes wrong and someone says the wrong thing to another person and I have to involve HR, I don't love doing it. So there are risks with it, right? But it is very rewarding that you know that you're investing time and energy to create the next generation or create an opportunity for someone that is extremely passionate and they will get there. Outsourcing costs money, but you have one throat to choke. And I've always liked this statement because you get to just point and say, you know what? Our penetration test vendor just screwed this up today. We're gonna to be replacing them the next year. And your boss is like, now we're doing it. Now we have accountability. Um, you know, it, it's tough, uh, but the hybrid approach is better. I think, you know, from the, the keystone on the side, you wanna outsource things you truly understand, process and technology that you actually get. Um, if you outsource your static analysis or your dynamic scanning and yet you fundamentally don't know what the solution is, what rule engines and how the tuning's working, um, if they even have the right credentials to authenticate and they're doing all the role-based testing that you ask them to do, but you have no visibility into that except for the output of the results that get fed into some defect tracking, it's gonna be a tough day. Um, I've had some friends in this position and um, you know, when the stuff hits the fan, it's not pretty when they're asked a simple question of are we covered for heart bleed? And they're like, I'm gonna have to go check. And they gotta call seven people to get that answer because they just don't know what tool they're even using. So funding the program can be pretty fun. Um, as I run down to like five minutes now, business owner versus project baked are, are, are similar, right? Where you have to work with someone else to get funding. And this can be very, very challenging if you're chasing down budget codes. 
to get someone to pay for a penetration test that you're trying to convince them that they should do. It sucks, it doesn't work, it's terrible. I always recommend internally funding, and if your finance process doesn't work this way, work with your finance team to get your own security or tech budget. Um, that way you have more intelligence, but you're gonna have to forecast. You're gonna have to look at what you've done in the past, and then you're gonna have to try and understand where you're going in the future. Sometimes code doesn't release. How you address that? You go have that discussion with your finance team on a monthly basis. You may not want to be friends with your finance team, but I highly recommend that monthly coffee chat running through your spreadsheet saying, we did not spend X, Y, and Z, or we went over, so you're tracking for the full year. If you wait for the full year to get to the end and you're a quarter million over, um, it could be a rough discussion. Areas of focus with high return on investment as we jump into the last two slides. Uh, training and education, uh, key takeaway here is live coaching is always going to be the most important and impactful to building that relationship with an individual engineer. I reflect back to the first bank I worked at where I had to explain why a null check was not enough for input validation. A null check is basically, is there something there, right? Cool, well, what value is going in there? He's like, I got the null check. I'm like, yeah, 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 but that's the point because we need to validate based on what data is going in versus I can inject script or malicious code every time. And he's like, well, how'd you do that? I have the null check. And I'm like, so that null check only gets, you know, and you, you take the time to unpack it. Um, the sneaker net is always important because you, you have the opportunity to have someone walk up to you and you walk up to them and engage. Um, if you're sitting in that ivory tower in another building and no one knows who you are or how you do things, you're not gonna be successful. Uh, I think honestly hitting the street, having the relationships, checking in with the teams, and this goes back to trust. How much trust do I have with each team and that product? How much bad code are they delivering? I'm probably walking over and saying what's up to that team a lot more than I am to the team that has you know, no defects using every service. They have security champions that get this, and it's easy. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is brand and be bold there. And what I mean by that is have swag, have things, make it cool, make it fun, and I, I think that always helps drive a better message as opposed to, you know, we got an AppSec thing and we break stuff. Uh, that only goes so far. Uh, embrace open source. Uh, scanning technology, you don't have to pay for those silver bullet vendors, but sometimes you have to. Uh, but there are cases where a lot of these things, like I mentioned, are built in, and if you take the time to look at your specific tech stack, I can almost guarantee you will find in modern technology most security frameworks or controls that could just be enabled. Uh, OWASP, absolutely. I mean, Zap Proxy will get a lot of stuff done for you. Why not use it uh, if you can't spend $369 on Burp? Crazy, right? Uh, but if you don't want to spend thousands on some other enterprise scanning solution, I get it, and sometimes budget can be hard. Uh, but if you don't fundamentally understand that business, you're never going to be able to just flip those switches. And there are solutions out there. Um, you know, if you look at the build pipeline, like an artifact, you can get a license check out of that for free. You didn't have to go buy a component analysis to tell you vulnerabilities and license issues. And last one's asset management. This is the most important thing. So any place I go to before I get started, I wanna know where is everything? Where is the attack surface? Not only internally, but externally. And then externally, I wanna monitor that with some sort of perimeter security assessment program or just ongoing attack surface monitoring. Uh, from the inside out, I wanna have a business built intelligence framework that says here are all of our apps, here's the risk associated with it, here's the data that flows through that. Now while I think questionnaires are great, uh, we're coming to a place where questionnaires only get us so far based on candor. Uh, I'm finding a lot more opportunity with automation that you can turn on certain API analysis or some sort of stream analysis to look at what data elements are actually flowing through applications. And if you detect it in the clear and it's not encrypted, or you know, lo and behold it's encoded and they believe it's encrypted, um, you're able to then extract and have a reality check on where those applications truly sit from a risk standpoint. Uh, so let's wrap it up. Hygiene over hype. Know your stuff, where it's at. It will always help compared to those silver bullets that will solve everything. Buying one vendor to do all these things at once to be an AppSec program for you is an absolute mindset for failure. Dialogue over confidentiality. Don't hide those reports. Put them in the backlog. Engage the right folks. Let people help because they want to win with that organization as well. Carrot beats stick. That swag, that brand, that element of supporting each other and calling out people doing amazing work as opposed to shaming the crap out of someone that just messed up and put the company at risk, um, you have to have those conversations, right? It happens, but at the same time, don't ostracize them. Don't flog them in public and say, this person could have took down the company. Don't be the CEO going in front of the 
government and saying this one guy didn't report that vulnerability and this led to the, like, the biggest data breach in the US ever. That's not cool. What you wanna do is raise up the people that are doing great things and show them as a great example to the rest of the organization of this person became a security champion, they did a threat model, they helped me with this, this is how ironclad that piece of software is now. All their peers are going to that person. That person is now answering questions and becoming part of the network of securing this environment much more effectively. Lastly, always be closing, but I'm gonna change this because as I thought about it last night, I think risk management's important, but always be learning. Don't stop, if you do, and you think you're an expert at any of this, uh, good luck. I'm not an expert, I've, I've learned some stuff along the way, I've wanted to share, but I think this is a continuous journey where if you think you've made it to the top and you say you're the expert, and you have to tell people you're the expert, you are not. You have to take the time to always take in more information and be willing to learn from others. So with that, um, here's my contact info. I'll take questions, I have three hood, like sweatshirts to throw out to the first three questions and I'm running out the door. Cool. So questions, thoughts, feedback, whatever. Yeah. Releases. Yep, I think release makes more sense because if you say, you know, four hours and your release uh, only happens once on a Friday and then you have to wait till Monday, then you have that three day lag, right? You got a catch. Question. And then I, I, yeah. I have a conversation with their legal person or their security person, and I've learned that from the other side of challenging all these vendors. And I think when you take the time to unpack the why, they're gonna have a higher confidence in your security program. And when I talk through why WAFs aren't that great with someone that's part of a large media company, and they're like, yeah, we're still in monitoring mode, you know, and it's one of those things where you, you can actually digress a little bit and understand why, because you're just talking legal to legal, and that only gets so far, right? One more, one sweatshirt. Yeah. Sure. Analysis paralysis is always gonna be very painful. If you don't know where to start, you're never gonna start, right? And I think if you have that inventory, where's your highest risk? Because that's where I wanna spend the time, because if that thing gets popped, that's gonna be a troublesome day. And I think if you look at that, plus the engineering capabilities, where can you hook in the quickest to get that win, to elevate that team and then showcase them? I think that's your recipe for success is if you find that team can operate effectively and you can partner and maybe you can just even be friendly and they're cool, that's the way to go about it. If you have a team that just doesn't want to talk to you, look, sometimes you don't want to waste the time trying to get friends that don't want to be friends. All right. Thank you. Thank you.